orientation map up the top right hand corner here so that you can see where we are. When we deal with Archie's frog, the IUCN lists this frog as critically endangered. So it's Lyopelma archii, they're critically endangered and they only occur on the North Island. So here's the North Island here. And when we look at where they occur, and these again are historical distributions, um, they're sites where we know we, we have seen frogs in the past. We've got a population down here, and this is a small population in a place known as Farrier Arena. And then this is the Coromandel Peninsula on the North Island, so you can see it's this little peninsula that's sticking out up there. So this is the Coromandel Peninsula, and this is the stronghold population. This island at the top here is called Great Barrier Island. So that will come up later on when we talk about mining. So Great Barrier Island has some Hotchdetter's frogs on, doesn't have any Archie's frogs, as far as we know. Remember, when you look at Archie's frogs, they are very cryptic animals, they don't move very much, and I'll give you a little quiz in a minute to see if you can actually see the frogs in a, in a slide like this. So they occur in two localities in the Upper North Island, and we estimate, and that's the only thing we can do is to estimate their numbers, we estimate that there's somewhere between 5,000 and 20,000 individuals. Obviously, in a frog like this that is very cryptic, they occur in forests, it's very difficult to get an accurate count on how many there are. Um, there are some plots over here that Ben Bell, who I mentioned earlier, has been um, monitoring for the last 30 or 40 years, and he is the main person in New Zealand who has got an idea on how these populations are going. Now these frogs occur on the forest floor, they're very small, they're usually less than 40 millimeters long, uh, they're quite slow moving, very well camouflaged, and they're fully terrestrial. So they lay their eggs on land, they don't need to go into the water at all, but obviously they occur in these nice moist temperate forests that we have on the Coromandel. This is a dad, um, a male frog, and what happens is that they um, probably uh, talk to each other through chemical scents, they work out which one's a male or which one's a female, probably other things are going on as well, they probably manage to work out whether they're kin or not, and then they mate, they probably have external fertilization, and the male fertilizes the eggs and then he sits over the eggs, so he guards the eggs. And we think that at this stage he's putting a lot of his skin secretions over the eggs, which prevents them from microbial attack. So they don't get any fungi or bacteria attacking the eggs, and when we find that the eggs have been abandoned, if the male has been killed or been chased away for some other reason, then the eggs generally succumb to microbial attack. So we feel it's quite important that the males actually protect the eggs here, and they, they uh, stop them from being predated upon, and also protect them from microbes. And they do this for about a month, so obviously during this time they wouldn't leave the eggs, they wouldn't go out and forage, and they would just be sitting there protecting the eggs, and probably keeping them moist as well. After about a month, what happens is the little tailed froglets hatch out of the eggs, and uh, as soon as they hatch out of the eggs, they climb onto Dad's back, and they squirm around onto Dad's back, and it's mainly water tension. Uh, that holds them onto Dad's back, and they'll sit on his back for a month or two as he hops around and does his everyday life. So at this stage, again, they're probably picking up maybe some very important uh, bacterial flora that they can have, that they can incorporate into their own skin to protect them from further microbial attack. So at this stage, they're also picking up the peptides from the Dad and uh, preventing themselves from succumbing to any microbial infections. Now we move on to Hochstetter's frog, and Hochstetter's frog is slightly more robust than Archie's frog, although they are quite similar. Hochstetter's frog is the only native frog we've got with a little bit of webbing. You can see in his back leg there, this top picture on the left hand side, we've got a little bit of webbing here, and that's because they do occur in streams. They also occur into the terrestrial area of Archie's frog, so they overlap with the populations there as well. Um, but they're mainly a stream-dwelling frog that they like to occur in the rocks on the edges of streams. It's listed as the IUCN as vulnerable, and there are many scattered populations all over the North Island. And when we've looked at the genetics of these populations, we find that there's quite a lot of genetic divergence between these populations, and it is quite possible that we could have cryptic species existing between these different populations. 
Notice here that they also occur on Great Barrier Island, and of course they occur on the Coromandel Peninsula, which is in the same localities as Ochi's frogs. And you can actually find them both under the same stone. Sometimes Archie's frog will venture closer to the stream, and sometimes Hotchdotter's frogs will venture further away from the stream. They are incredibly cryptic, as we'll see in a minute, um, and this gri gr bright green variant that I've got on the picture here is actually quite unusual. But in this one area that I went to up here in the Raukumara Ranges on the uh, towards the east coast Hawke's Bay area, we found a lot of these green frogs, and they were very cryptically colored. They're a little bit larger than Archie's frogs, and as I said, they're semi-aquatic, and they often pop into the water. Again, estimates are very difficult for these frogs, but because there are many more populations, we suspect that there's probably over 100,000 individuals. But they like to occur in streams that occur in native forests, and of course, those areas are well under threat in New Zealand. So here you are, you've now got 30 seconds to find three frogs on this slide. And in 30 seconds, a little uh, red ring will appear around these frogs and show you where these frogs are. So when I took this picture, um, or rather Cara took this picture and she sent it to me, I thought, why on earth did we take this picture? It was almost impossible to see the frogs. And this is very typical of when you're in the field looking for these frogs. You will turn over a stone, you'll look at them and you'll think, oh, there's nothing there. And then just as you're putting the stone back, you'll think, oh, maybe, maybe I did see something. Maybe I did see the frog. So now you can see the frogs, and there's three there. Um, and I know one of them will be difficult to see even when you know where it is. So this one up here is pretty obvious. Again, this was in the same area where a lot of the green frogs occurred. So there's the green one over there. There's another green one over there with its nose pointing to the right-hand side of the screen. It's vent over this side here, so that's the frog there. This little frog here is only 12 millimeters long, and he's staring straight at the camera. So there's one eye, and there's another eye over there. So you can see they're incredibly cryptic when they're in their natural environment. Very, very difficult to see. So you can understand why it's so difficult to get a handle on how many frogs there are in the wild. Now, Hodgdetter's frogs are the only ones that seem to have any kind of proper tadpole. And these tadpoles are, are quite strange beasts altogether. You can see that they've got this very large yolk sac. They don't feed as tadpoles. They just rely on their yolk reserves. And they have this uncanny ability to flip around and actually come out of the water. So if there's some damp mud next to the stream, the tadpoles can actually flip around and they, they flop around on the mud there. So they don't need to feed and the parents don't usually look after them that well. So Hochstetter's tadpoles are quite unique as well. Moving on to Hamilton's frog, and Hamilton's frog is probably the rarest frog in New Zealand, although the IUCN has only labeled it as endangered. And the reason why it's endangered is because we feel it is fairly well looked after in New Zealand. They only occur in one place, naturally, and that's a place called Stevens Island. And Stevens Island is the northernmost island here of the Marlborough Sands. These are a whole load of islands that occur um, in the sands just north of the South Island. And uh, you can see that there's two, two uh, records here. One is Stevens Island, and the other one is on Nuka Waiata. And the ones on Nuka Waiata were ones that we actually have released there in a translocation. So we did some modeling with the frogs on Stevens Island. We worked out how many we could actually take from Stevens Island and set up a new population to give us a chance that we got our eggs in more than one basket. And we've put them on Nuka Waiata, and they've just started breeding there. So that's a bit of a su success story. The important thing to 